webinar sponsored by Drug Policy Alliance, National Employment Law Project, Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, East Bay Community Law Center, Immigrant Legal Resource Center, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and the Legal Aid Association of California. My name is Jasmine and I'm the Trainings and Communications Associate here at LAC. Today's session is presented by a large panel of experts from at least six different nonprofits. Before we get started, I want to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, you can call 1-877-582-7011. If you have any questions about this specific webinar, you can email me at trainings with an S at laaconline.org, and I'll try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this college is muted, so if you have any questions about for the presenters, you can send them using your chat box. This session will be recorded and materials will be posted online after the training, so you'll have access to those things in the coming days. We will also be distributing MCLE certificates for two hours because this training goes until 2 p.m., um, probably by the end of the week. Okay, and with that, I will pass it off to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine, and um, thank you, LAC, for hosting this. I'd like to welcome everyone to this panel. Um, it's an all-star crew of presenters. I want to mention that um, we really appreciate also Kate Weisberg from Bay Area Legal Aid for jumping on at the last minute also. Um, and so Bela is represented as well. First up, we have Beth Avery from the National Employment Law Project talking about AB 1008, Ban the Box. Take it away. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, well, my name is Beth Avery. I am a staff attorney from the National Employment Law Project. Um, just in case you're not familiar with us, we're a nonprofit organization that conducts research and advocates on issues affecting low wage and unemployed workers. Um, but I focus on workers facing barriers to employment because of arrest or conviction records. Um, and as Eva uh, stated already, I'm uh, joining today to talk about the California Fair Chance Act or AB 1008. Um, which is the new statewide ban the box law here in California. I only have a few minutes to talk about AB 1008 today, so I'll just jump right in. Um, but for a tad of perspective, um, 31 states now have fair chance hiring laws or policy uh, policies. Um, since 2013, California has banned the box for public sector jobs. But last year with AB 1008, California became the 10th state to ban the box for private employers and also strengthen the law, the ban the box law for public sector. Um, you'll notice on the screen that it says 11 states now have private sector ban the box. That's because the state of Washington um, adopted a law just last week. Now we'll get into a bit of the specifics, some of the components of the law. Um, so on your screen now is just an overview of the hiring process. Um, I'll go into the process a little more in the next few slides, um, but the major components of the law are to, one, ban the box, which just means delaying um, inquiries about conviction or arrest records um, and delaying background checks until after a conditional job offer. Um, second main component is that employers uh, must now individually assess the candidate, the job candidate, um, and his or her conviction, so no more blanket bans. Um, and the third main component is just, you know, basic kind of due process. So employers got to provide clear notice and you know an opportunity for the job applicant to respond with information when the employer wants to rescind a job offer because of the person's conviction history. Okay, so now let's kind of jump in a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, the com some of the components of the law. Um, as I said already, most basically the Fair Chance Act bans the box. <laughs> uh, it requires employers to delay any questions um, about a person's conviction record um, and delay background checks until after a conditional offer. Um, and so, you know, a conditional job offer is, you know, basically just offering the job pending a background check, assuming that the employer wants to run one. Um, the link at the bottom um, is to a sample conditional offer letter um, that, that is available from NELP if if you want want to see one or you know send one to an employer who might need to know what to do. Um, so after after a conditional offer, um, the employer can ask questions about the conviction record um, 
and uh, can run a background check. But when considering the conviction record, the employer must conduct an individualized assessment um, and consider whether the conviction has a direct and adverse relationship with the duties of the job sought by the applicant. So that means before deciding to rescind a job offer, even if the employer runs a background check um, and you know now they see the conviction record, before they decide to rescind the offer, they must consider at least three common sense factors. The nature of the offense, the nature of the job sought, and the time that has passed since the offense. Now these factors are also found in the um, EEOC guidance of 2012. Um, and new California regulations under the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Act. If I have time, I'll touch on those a little later. Um, but these factors are, are, you know, familiar. They're repeating. We didn't. These aren't just out of thin air. Um, and AB 1008, just to flag this, it also repeats the labor codes bars. Um, again, so pre-existing law already prohibited employers from uh, considering non-conviction information, so arrests judicially dismissed offenses, juvenile records um, at any time in the hiring process, even after a conditional offer. Now, after the employer has extended a conditional offer, learned about the applicant's record, and conducted that individualized assessment, the employer may still wish to rescind the offer. Um, but in order to do so, the employer needs to follow a certain process. Um, so first, most basically, provide written preliminary notice to the job applicant of the intent to rescind the offer because of conviction history. So let the let the person know what's what's up. Um, and you know, pretty basic, but including a copy of the background check, the record, um, if any was received by the employer. So whatever the if the employer considered a copy of the, the rap sheet, the you know, the background check report, provide a copy of that. And also identify the specific convictions that are forming the basis of rescinding the offer. So, you know, there may be a bunch of things on a record, you know, which are, which are the problems, which are the reason you're rescinding the, the job offer. After that, the employer must allow the applicant at least five business days to respond with evidence of, you know, either inaccuracies in the record, mitigating circumstances, so, you know, what happened when, when the conviction, like what, what was the offense that formed the basis of the, the conviction, maybe there's some, some pertinent information there, and evidence of um, rehabilitation, you know, efforts at rehabilitation since the conviction. Um, I'll just flag that regulations are currently pending um, as to how that five days is calculated, so look for more information on that coming up. Um, and I, I've got some links on there for sample notices that include some examples, um, list some examples of, you know, what rehabilitation evidence might be. Now, if the applicant responds within the five business days, um, with information on mitigation, mitigating circumstances or rehabilitation, then the employer is required to review it. Um, and if the employer still wants to rescind the job offer, it must again provide written notice to the job applicant of that final decision. But what if an employer violates the job applicant's rights um, under AB 1008? Well, there are, there's a, a possibility for filing a complaint with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Um, if you haven't done that already, you can do so online or by mail. I've got a link on the screen, which probably doesn't work on your screen right now, but uh, hopefully you'll receive a copy of these slides after the webinar and be able to access it. And you just need to file that complaint within a year of the violation. And then either you either you know the applicant can proceed with the DFEH investigation, so they, um, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing will investigate and try to mediate and that sort of thing. Or if an attorney is involved, and usually it's only advisable if an attorney is involved, um, the job applicant um, can request a right to sue notice, and then they can file suit in court within one year from the date of that notice. Some other important details about the law are, you know, which employers, which which are covered. Um, so employers with five or more employees, um, generally private and public, are covered. Um, there are exceptions, um, and I'll just highlight um, that perhaps the, the most pertinent exception is for positions, so that's the, the specific jobs, for which, you know, state, federal, or local law requires a background check or prohibits the employer from hiring people with certain convictions. Um, so 
if a law applies, then when applying for that specific job, you know, that's exempted. I'll also flag that this covers virtually all employment relationships, so part-time, contracted work, contingent work, temp work, um, it's pretty broad in, in what DFEH covers here. Another thing to flag is the interaction with local fair chance ordinances. Um, on the, the, the screen with the map a few slides ago, you may have noticed that um, you know, 17 localities, so that's cities, um, counties, or the District of Columbia, um, have adopted private fair chance and the box laws. Um, two of those are San Francisco and Los Angeles. AB 1008 does not preempt those. Instead, um, it sets a floor. Um, and so if, and, and in certain cases they are, San Francisco and Los Angeles ordinances require more of the employer or provide additional rights to the applicant, then the employers in those cities need to uh, comply with those requirements as well. So for example, both San Francisco and Los Angeles require posting certain notices in the workplaces. AB 1008 does not require that, but in those cities, you still have to do that. So as I flagged earlier, um, New California regulations inter interpreting the Fair Employment and Housing Act um, were issued in 2017. That's where that individualized assessment comes in. Um, and I'll just flag, this isn't this is a little separate from AB 1008, but it's very, very closely related. So these regulations basically codify that improper consideration of a record in the employment context can violate anti-discrimination law, it can violate the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Um, and so that was previously embraced in, in case law and um, the EEOC issued a guidance in 2012, basically saying the same about Title VII, but now it's codified, now it's in regulation. Um, and so what that means is if, if an employer is going to deny a job based on a person's record, um, it must be job related and consistent with business necessity. Um, it applies to all adverse employment actions, not just hiring. So whereas AB 1008 is um, limited to the hiring context, the regulations apply to promotion decisions, termination decisions, et cetera. Um, and I think very importantly, um, the regulations also provide that uh, state and national statistics that show race disparities in the criminal justice system. So uh, communities of color are you know, arrested and locked up more than, than other uh, populations. Under the regulations, that presumptively, presumptively demonstrates adverse impact. And so for those who have litigated anti-discrimination cases, you'll recognize that's hugely important. Um, I will flag in this bright red box on the screen right now that re the regulations I just discussed are currently being revised by the Fair Employment and Housing Council to incorporate AB 1008 and you know, the additional provisions of law there. Um, so, uh, your comments in support of strong regulations are crucial. Um, so uh, comments are due by April 4th. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to take part in that process. My contact information is gonna be on the next slide um, and I can you know, hook you up with some sample comments or, or you know, tell you more about how to comment. But um, these regulations are crucially important. We have to make sure that employers aren't able to roll them back uh, as these regulations are being being revised. Um, the next slide um, just has some resources. So when you get these slides in your email after the webinar, um, we'll have you know, fact sheets for job seekers, links to the regs, um, guide covering all the laws across the country. Uh, and finally, my contact information if you want to reach out, if you want to uh, learn more about providing comments to these regulations. Um, Thanks, and yeah, and with that, I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> please go ahead, Ava. We have about one minute for questions. We're gonna have one or two minutes for questions after each presentation. Uh, so if people have any questions, please type them into the little box. Um, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that while Beth wraps up. Oh boy, wrap up. All right, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I already did wrap up. I. Um, I could go into more details if folks had questions about it. Um, maybe I'll just, um, I flagged earlier that there are um, exceptions to which employers are covered. Um, the exceptions are a little, a little different for public sector. So take a look at the law, the language there, um, and, and the, the fact sheets 
have a little more information basically on everything that I talked about. Um, and seeing no questions, you know, one thing I flagged in a footnote on one of my earlier slides um, is that five business days are required to for the job applicant to respond. Um, but there can be a requirement for five additional business days if the applicant notifies the employer that they want to, um, you know, show that their record is inaccurate. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. And I think I'm out of time. You are. So next up, um, we have, uh, oh, it looks like, oh, sorry. Next up, we have uh, Rodney Holcomb, a attorney at Drug Policy Alliance, talking about Proposition 64. Go for it, Rodney. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Rodney Holcomb, and I'm a staff attorney at the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, the Drug Policy Alliance uh, promotes drug policies grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. DPA was involved in the drafting of the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, or Prop 64 for short, and is now working to ensure that the record change provisions are implemented by hosting clean slate events across the state. Well, today, I have the pleasure of discussing Prop 64's record change provisions with you all. Prop 64 offers a second chance to thousands of Californians with prior cannabis convictions by allowing them to either clear or reduce those convictions, and in the process, to rid themselves of the collateral consequences that come attached to criminal convictions. Before we get started, I wanna give you all a brief overview of how we'll approach this topic. First, we'll identify the penalty changes of Prop 64. Next, we'll discuss how the record change provisions operate. Then, we'll discuss disqualifying offenses for Prop 64 relief. And finally, we'll cover questions you'll want to consider when completing a, props, a, a petition rather, or application for reclassification or resentencing under Prop 64. Please download our resentencing and reclassification guide for more detailed information about Prop 64 reclassification and resentencing. And this can be found at www.drugpolicy.org forward slash my dash prop dash 64. So to begin, Prop 64 amended penalties for four criminal offenses in California's Health and Safety Code. Section 11357, possession of cannabis or cannabis concentrates. Section 11358, cultivation of cannabis. Section 11359, possession with the intent to sell cannabis. And Section 11360, the sales, transport, or giving away of cannabis. The penalties for these offenses now differ based on an individual's age at the time they were convicted. The three age groups are folks who are 21 and over, folks who are at between the ages of 18 and 20, and youth 17 and under. Prop 64 legalized the possession, transport, purchase, consumption, and sharing of up to an ounce of cannabis flour and up to eight grams of cannabis concentrate for adults 21 and over, and now allows the same age group to grow up to six plants in their homes. For youth 17 and under, all marijuana penalties became infractions that required drug education and community service rather than arrest and incarceration. These penalty changes are retroactive, meaning people with prior marijuana convictions can have their convictions for which they've completed their sentence, either dismissed and sealed or redesignated, or if they're currently serving a sentence, have their sentences recalled or dismissed to reflect the new penalties. These two processes are known as reclassification and resentencing and can be found in the Health and Safety Code section 11361.8. These provisions apply to both youth and adults with prior marijuana convictions. We'll discuss both of these processes at greater length in a bit. Please note that unlike Prop 47, Prop 64 does not have a time limit for filing applications. Please take a look at the appendix of the Guide to Resentencing and Reclassification for specific breakdowns of each of the four change penalties and the amounts associated with each, with each of these penalties. So 
So there are three scenarios that you'll want to consider with regard to Prop 64's record change provisions. The first scenario applies to cases where the conviction occurred after Prop 64 passed. In these cases, the defendant will be subject to the new penalties. The second scenario involves folks who already completed their sentences for Prop 64 eligible cannabis convictions. They can file a Prop 64 application with the court to have their conviction reduced or dismissed and sealed from their records. This process is called reclassification or redesignation. The final scenario is for folks who are currently completing their sentences. If a person is in prison or county jail, on probation, parole, or post-release community supervision for their cannabis offense, they can petition the court for resentencing. So there's a common misconception that certain persons are disqualified from receiving Prop 64 relief because of their prior convictions. Well, uh, this is not true. In fact, there are no disqualifiers for receiving Prop 64 relief. Relief can, however, be discretionary. Resentencing is discretionary if the petitioner poses an unreasonable risk of danger to public safety, meaning they are at risk of committing a super strike as defined by section 667E2C4 of the Penal Code. Both reclassification and resentencing are uh, discretionary if the petitioner would have been convicted of a wobbler, wherein the offense could have been charged as either a felony or misdemeanor if Prop 64 were in effect at the time the petitioner was charged. This is the case for persons who were convicted of Health and Safety Code Section 11358 for cultivating seven or more plants, and for folks who were convicted of Section 11359 or Section 11360 violations. Please take a look at these sections of the code or at the appendix of the DPA guide to see which prior offenses or facts make reclassification or resentencing discretionary. Keep in mind though, that just because a person was convicted under the old statute does not mean that they will be convicted under the new statute. For example, all cultivation was once treated as a felony, meaning a person growing one plant was convicted in the same way that a person growing 10 plants was. Now, the penalties for growing fewer than seven plants and seven or more plants differs. So, it's important that you determine the amount in question when petitioning for relief. If that information is not available, petition for the best possible relief. And we'll touch on this again in a second. So unlike Prop 47, Prop 64 does not require petitioners to prove that their prior conduct qualifies for resentencing or reclassification as described in Section 11361.8 of the Health and Safety Code. Instead, instead the prosecution must prove by clear and convincing evidence that the petitioner is not entitled to relief. The court is required to presume that the applicant is entitled to relief, and the court is required to presume that the applicant is entitled to a dismissal and sealing, redesignation, or recall or dismissal of sentence unless the prosecution proves by clear and convincing evidence that the applicant is not entitled to relief. All right, next, you'll wanna think of each of the following questions when determining what sort of relief is available to your client. First, how old was your client when convicted? Remember, the penalties now differ based on age, and a person who was 17 at the time of conviction would have a different outcome than a person who was 24 when convicted. Next, how much cannabis or cannabis concentrates did the person, or your client rather, possess? Here, you want to take a look at the Guide to Resentencing and Reclassifications Appendix to see the differences in possession amounts and the associated penalties. Next, what type of cannabis did your client possess? Remember, there are differences in penalties for cannabis concentrates and cannabis flower, so make sure you know which of the two is being referred to. Next, did your client possess on school grounds? Please note, that possession on school grounds carries a heavier penalty than possession not on school grounds. Take a look uh, at the DPA guide uh, to see these differences. And finally, 
can the prosecutor prove through admissible evidence that an exception to relief exists? It's important to note here that you should always petition for the best possible outcome unless you have reason to believe that an exception to the requested relief exists. I'll go back to the cultivation example that we walked through earlier to clarify this. So say a person were convicted of cultivating, but you are unaware of the number of plants in question. Well, in this case, it's best that you petition for the best possible relief. For a person aged 21 or over at the time of conviction, that would be a complete dismissal. For a person between the ages of 18 and 20, that would be a reduction to an infraction. And for youth, as with any other Prop 64 eligible conviction, that would be a complete reduction to infraction. So a few final notes uh, before I open the floor for questions. The Judicial Council's form for Prop 64 reclassification and resentencing uh, does not let you indicate the exact relief you seek. Uh, please take note of the fact that there is no requirement that you use the Judicial Council form or any other particular form when filing a Prop 64 petition or application. With that in mind, you should consider filing a motion or creating a form that allows you to indicate the specific relief that you desire for your client uh, so that your client gets the best possible relief. I'm sure many of you have also heard about the move many DAs are taking to automatically clear or reduce prior marijuana convictions. Uh, this has happened in Alameda County, San Francisco, San Diego County, and Sonoma County. Uh, this is a very welcome move. Uh, but it is left to be determined how long it'll take before these processes are fully operational. So it's best that you continue to file petitions and applications uh, on your client's behalf, whether the county has automized their process, automated rather, their process or not. Uh, another quick note, uh, for a lengthier look at Prop 64 resentencing and reclassification, I'd point you to the Practicing Lawyers <laughs> Institute training on Prop 64, or the Pro Bono Training Institute training on Prop 64, which should be published sometime this week. Uh, and finally, uh, Rose Khan, who is also joining us on this uh, really great webinar, uh, will discuss how Prop 64 impacts non-citizens. Uh, so uh, otherwise, thank you all for joining us and um, I, I look forward to hearing your questions. All right, and we have a question. Oh, we have a couple questions, great. Uh, so the first question is, do you know what the impact will be of the automatic expungement that places like San Francisco are doing? Uh, so, okay, I'm looking at the question, do you know the impact will be of the automatic expungement? So that would be statewide, so it wouldn't only be applicable at the county level, that would uh, expunge it uh, across the state. So that person's conviction would uh, be changed from felony to misdemeanor, misdemeanor to infraction, or completely dismissed uh, to reflect the new law, and it would um, be acknowledged across the state. Okay, and the other question is, has DPA seen proof that the Health and Safety Code Section 11357 are being sealed after Prop 64 release? So we have worked directly with some folks to help them with this process. And yes, from what we've seen, that has been the case. I know the Judicial Council also publishes numbers on the, um, or publishes data on the number of folks who have submitted uh, petitions and applications, uh, but unfortunately they don't uh, indicate the outcome. Uh, but with 11357s, there are no, um, there's no discretion in uh, getting relief. So um, there should really be no setback. A person, sh a person should not, in any circumstance, not receive their relief. So I, I suppose if there is a situation where that is the case, I'd love to hear about it. But um, there are no disqualifying offenses, and there is no discretion in receiving 11 uh, receiving Prop 64 relief for an 11-357. So uh, as far as we know, um, these convictions are being completely sealed uh, for persons who possess 28.5 grams or less of cannabis flower or eight grams or less of cannabis concentrate. Thank you. All right, I'm up next and I'm gonna cover, 
uh, dismissing convictions under Penal Code 1203.42. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to cover all of realignment sentencing, easy peasy. Uh, for real, though, I'm actually going to give a quick summary of what uh, Penal Code 1203.42 covers, some practice tips, and then answer any questions that you have. So this is an abridged text of Penal Code 1203.42, if a defendant was sentenced prior to the implementation of the 2011 realignment legislation for a crime for which he or she would otherwise have been eligible for sentencing pursuant to Subdivision H of Section 1170 of the Penal Code, which is realignment sentencing, the court in its discretion and in the interests of justice may order a dismissal. So just to give a little bit of context for the law. Um, okay, sorry. To give a little bit of context for the law, basically realignment went into effect October 1st, 2011, and that made those non-serious, non-violent, non-sexual felony convictions uh, result in a sentence of county jail. And of course, probation is still an option in all of these cases. So that means that something kind of weird happened, and that is that um, if a person was sentenced September 30th of 2011 or any time before realignment went into effect, they're going into state prison for a non-non-non-felony. But if they were sentenced after realignment, they were going to county jail. And then we passed a law, 1203.41, that allowed for clean slate remedies for those sentences for people who are sentenced under realignment. And so there was this weird thing where someone could have the same exact conviction from 2010 or 2012, and the person with the older conviction wasn't eligible. Well, not anymore. Um, now we have 1203.42. So it's really just kind of extending 1203.41 to these older convictions. Uh, so let's talk about screening. Here's an overview of the process. The first thing you're going to look is uh, questions one through three, whether or not um, whether or not realignment could potentially even apply, and therefore whether or not 1203.4 could apply, um, whether or not it's the best option. So Prop 47 or Prop 64, which Rodney just talked about, might be a better option um, for that conviction. And then we go into actually the sentencing process to see if had that person been convicted under realignment, that conviction would lead to a realignment sentence. And then a quick question of how much time has passed. So let's get into it with a hypo. We're going to do three different convictions at once, just so we can kind of see the different paths going through uh, these felonies are going through it. So the first question we're asking is, is this a felony? Did it happen before realignment? And did the person serve a prison term? So here we've got three felonies. They're all before realignment went into effect, but this person got probation. So that means they're not getting relief under 1203.42 but they can still get relief under 1203.4. So they're not out of luck. It's just recognizing that it's part of a larger scheme. Um, then we're going to look to see if there's a different or better remedy available. So Prop 47 or 64, where someone could have served a prison sentence um, for a specific conviction, and they might be able to get relief. So we're ignoring for purposes of this, uh, or I can just tell you that forging a prescription is not Prop 47 or 64 eligible, um, but second degree burglary might be depending on the fact. So if it was shoplifting under $950 uh, during business hours, but got charged and convicted as burglary, that might be. So you'd wanna be talking with your client to figure out if Prop 47 is available there. And in that case, You'd want to use Prop 47 or Prop 64 because you can actually dismiss it, or sorry, you can reduce it and then dismiss it, which is better than um, just dismissing it for two reasons. One, 
Prop 47 and 64 are often mandatory. And then also having a dismissed misdemeanor looks better than a dismissed felony. Uh, this is a picture of me as a judge. So once we've determined that we're potentially eligible, we'll assume that we talked with the client and um, it wasn't, it doesn't sound like a good Prop 47 option. Uh, we're gonna actually go into the sentencing question. So we're applying realignment sentencing law in this clean slate clinic. Um, so you can't have a serious or violent conviction within, in order to get realignment sentencing. And so that means that if you have any prior serious or violent convictions or you're convicted of a serious or violent conviction in this particular conviction, then you're not going to be eligible. And that also includes um, if you were previously required to register in the Penal Code 290 registry, which is the sex offense registry, um, or if this conviction is causing you to. And so I have a list that I've created and you'll get uh, as a PDF as part of these resources, a list of all the serious and violent convictions. So let's apply it here. Um, Forging a prescription is neither serious nor violent. Second degree burglary is neither serious nor violent. But first degree burglary is both classified as both serious and violent. So this is not a prior to second degree burglary. So it means that conviction number three is not going to be eligible, but conviction number two may still be eligible. Because, um, you know, it would have to be a prior. It's not just the sentencing court looking into the future or anything like that. Uh, similarly, there are a number of convictions that have to be done through, that have to be sentenced to prison time if they're, um, if the prison, person is going to be sentenced to a term of incarceration. And so that list, again, my office kind of consolidated a list made by Judge Cozens of all the excluding convictions. And so we're going to look again here and we're going to say, okay, so we're ignoring that one, the conviction number one, because it's not a, we're not worried about priors. We're just looking at current convictions and we're going to look at the second one. Okay. So second degree burglary. Oh no, I see burglary, but it only applies to first degree burglary. Oh, and just for fun, I'm letting you know that had this person been sentenced to prison, they wouldn't have been eligible for realignment. But first degree burglary would exclude them. This is second degree burglary. So, um, you know, conviction number three continues to be excluded from 1203.42, 1203.42. Uh, but uh, conviction number two still looks good. The last question we have to figure out is oh, let me jump back. I'm going to fight the hypo and also recognize that I'm hitting my time limit right now. And I'm going to keep going though. All of those examples were just kind of one conviction per case. And so if you have a client who has multiple convictions for one case, which, you know, happens, if, it's, if there is one felony that excludes them, they're not going to be sentenced under realignment. Um, however, if they have a misdemeanor, um, they'd still be eligible for sentencing under realignment. And so that felony would still be eligible for 1203.4 relief. And then their misdemeanor that they were convicted of would be potentially eligible for 1203.4A relief. Um, all right, so the last question you ask is, has enough time passed? Because all of this is pre-realignment, so all of these convictions are prior to 2011, this probably isn't going to be a problem. So here we're really looking at conviction number two. Uh, our client got 16 months in prison in 2001. Let's do the math. 2001 plus 16 months is 2002. It's been certainly two years. Um, so as a reminder, all of these petitions are discretionary, so you're going to want to gather letters of support and write a declaration with your client. And then um, 
the CR 180 hasn't been updated. And so San Jose State Record Clearance Project has developed a draft petition that people can use and I'll be sending those around. Additionally, I'll be sending around any, um, I'll be sending around this PDF, which has the serious and violent convictions listed here. And then also all the other excluding sentencing uh, convictions. And I have instructions on this first page just to kind of remind people uh, when they're sitting in a clinic. <sighs> Does anybody have any questions about that? <laughs> I want to also let you know that there's a slightly longer version of this on the Pro Bono Training Institute. And you can access it on uh, pbtraining.org slash all dash courses. And then you select expungement in Prop 47 and then expungement 1203.42. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, and I went over time. So it's actually Meredith's turn to discuss record clearance under Penal Code 236.41. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and listening to me talk incredibly quickly about that process. Hi, this is Meredith Desitel. I am a youth justice attorney and fellow at Bay Area Legal Aid. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, so as the slides are coming up, um, I'll be speaking today about a new record remedy that went into effect last year. It's um, under California Penal Code Section 236.14. Um, and it is a remedy for um, victims of human trafficking. Um, it essentially allows for vacature of past arrests, convictions, and adjudications where the person was a victim of human trafficking at the time of the incident. I think this is a very powerful remedy, and I hope those of you who practice um, records remedies are able to incorporate it into your practice. Um, my first slide is going to talk about um, a definition of human trafficking. Um, but before I get into that, um, what I do want to acknowledge at the outset is that this law really reflects a dichotomy that's pervasive in the criminal legal system between victims and perpetrators of crime, which we know really does not match reality. Um, vacature provides uh, relief for one particular type, um, victim of a type of crime, human trafficking. Um, and I think it's critically important not to separate people with records into more or less deserving categories. Um, because the truth is that across the population of people impacted by the criminal legal system, there's trauma and systemic oppression. So just recognizing that at the outset, I consider this remedy to be one tool for pushing back against mass criminalization and um, something that we need more of across the board. So I'm going to do a quick overview of trafficking and the new law. Um, forgive me for moving quickly. If the slides have more info than I um, will cover in my talking points, but hopefully you'll receive them in your email to go um, to review more closely. So to start with, um, a little background on trafficking. Trafficking is a form of modern slavery. It involves controlling a person through force, fraud, or coercion to exploit the victim for forced labor, sex, or both. And I am having trouble. Okay, here we go. Um, I want to bust a few myths on trafficking laws. So first, federal human trafficking law contemplates both U.S. citizens and foreign nationals as victims. Um, in fact, one report found that over 70% of trafficking victims in California were U.S. citizens. Um, two, human trafficking does not require any kind of travel, transportation, movement across borders. Um, three, Trafficking does not require physical restraint, bodily harm, or physical force. It can be um, affected by fraud or coercion as well. And finally, human trafficking includes but is not limited to forced prostitution. Um, in reentry legal services, forced prostitution might be something we're most likely to spot because um, the charges will be most apparent, um, but just know that there are other types of trafficking that uh, might be eligible for this relief. 
So some definitions on um, human trafficking. There are There is in the federal law, which I'm gonna use because of the clarity of the language compared to California law, um, there's sex trafficking and labor trafficking. For sex trafficking, it includes the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act in which that act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such act has not attained 18 years of age. So um, that last part is important to note. Um, it's trafficking per se when the victim is a minor and you don't need to prove that force, fraud, or coercion. And then um, labor trafficking um, is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt, bondage, or slavery. Here, the California definition um, is much more complicated, but um, just know that um, California Penal Code 236.1G does incorporate the federal definition. So with that definition of what trafficking is, I'm gonna move on now to um, California's new vacature law. Um, it is codified at 236.14, and subsection A says that if a person was arrested for or convicted of any nonviolent offense committed while he or she was a victim of human trafficking, the person may petition the court for vacature relief of his or her convictions and arrest under this section. The petitioner shall establish by clear and convincing evidence that the arrest or conviction was the direct result of being a victim of trafficking. Here in the next slide as well, I'm gonna get, I have a little rundown of how vacature is different from set aside and dismissal. And I'll let you study this um, at greater length um, at your desktop. But um, for now, just know that vacature applies for nonviolent offenses. And I'll explain what um, that category includes. Um, and it doesn't specify sentence or disposition. So there's no distinction between whether someone got probation or jail sentence or prison sentence. It does require some proof of by clear and convincing evidence as well as a best interest and interest of justice um, showing. Um, and the power of the remedy is that the offense is deemed not to have occurred. Um, and that really um, comes forth in terms of the impact of the remedy. So vacated records are sealed and then destroyed within three years. Um, the statute explicitly states that um, the petitioner can refuse to acknowledge when denied that if asked about the incident. Um, and the statute explicitly states that um, a vacated offense cannot be distributed to licensing agencies. So this is where I think um, the vacature should be something that we're screening for really right off the top because of the, the um, scope of the remedy. So now to break down what it would take to um, petition for vacature relief. Um, I consider it to have sort of three elements, um, that there's trafficking, that there's an eligible offense, and that there's a nexus between the trafficking and the offense. So we already went through what it means to be a victim of human trafficking. It's defined, um, the crime of trafficking is defined in section 236.1, um, but I also refer to the um, federal law for ease. The eligible offenses are um, limited to nonviolent offenses, meaning that they cannot be contained in the list of offenses at uh, Penal Code Section 667.5C. I think it's about like 23 offenses, um, but it's a very specific penal code, so you would just need to cross-reference cross there. And it includes arrest convictions and juvenile adjudication, so um, can be uh, pretty expansive in that sense. Finally, there has to be a nexus to the trafficking, so the offense had to have been committed while the person was a victim of trafficking and the direct result of being a victim, and that requires clear and convincing evidence, which is a pretty high standard. Finally, in addition to those three prongs, the statute lays out some findings that the court has to make, so essentially I would consider these um, proof that the petitioner has to um, put forth to the court. So both that the petitioner is engaged in a good faith effort to distance him or herself from the trafficking scheme and that relief is both in the best interest of the petitioner and in the interest of justice, noting that um, 
there is a presumption in favor of the petitioner on these prongs for juvenile offenses. A few last things um, for filing a petition for vacature relief. Know that there's a timing um, that requires it to be filed within a reasonable time, but there's kind of a caveat for safety concerns. Um, the uh, re public record shall not disclose the full name of the petitioner, so um, attorneys should consider filing under initials or under seal. And um, the prosecutor has to be served and has 45 days to respond. If the petition is opposed, the court must hold a hearing, but the court can consolidate petitions from multiple jurisdictions, which could be a huge benefit. Um, the petitioner may be required to testify, um, which I think is important to keep in mind for someone who um, that might be a traumatizing experience for. Um, and in that case, it might be possible to appear electronically. So when you're getting ready to file, you're gonna to wanna to file a petition and proposed order. At this point, there's no judicial counsel form. It's my understanding that judicial counsel is interested in perhaps creating one, um, but I have not heard anything definitive on that front. Um, so I would suggest having your own petition because it is such a unique form of relief that um, any kind of modification to what we already have, I think would um, do a disservice to the relief you're seeking. And then you would need supporting documentation. Um, and here is a suggestion on the types of corroborating evidence that you might look for. Um, finally, if you are screening for vacature relief, you might look for offenses like um, 647 uh, sub B, solicitation type things, false ID to police officers. Um, you should be asking your clients if someone else benefited from what happened or if they were ever in a situation where meeting basic needs depended on doing certain things for someone else. Um, if you've heard me talk about this before, I've had a warning that we shouldn't seek relief for um, young people 21 and under receiving extended foster care benefits based on a delinquency case. Um, but a new law went into effect in January that says that youth whose cases are vacated will maintain their foster care benefits. So there's no longer that concern. But there remains a concern that um, you would want to consult with an immigration law expert if you were seeking vacature on behalf of a non-citizen client. And I will wrap up there with just mentioning that the ABA has a survivor reentry project that has extensive resources. So I would definitely encourage you to go there if you have further questions. Thank you. Great, and we have a question. And the question is, we have a couple questions. One is, does it work for immigration under Pickering standard? So I don't want to provide a definitive answer on that because in a sense, I don't think there is a definitive answer, um, but I'll give two suggestions. Um, one is that because um, there is no standard petition for this relief at this point, um, I think you should draft your own if you're representing a client who's not a citizen um, and take advantage of um, one of the subsections of the statute, 236.14 sub R, that says um, a court that grants relief pursuant to this section may take additional action as appropriate on the circ under the circumstances to carry out the purposes of this section. And I think that is an opportunity to ask for the type of relief that would be most necessary to um, acknowledge that this person is a survivor and that might include um, you know, in the order language that um, the conviction, for example, is deemed legally invalid. Um, and I would leave it to immigration law experts to, to help you craft that exact language, um, but that is something I think you have an opportunity to do under the vacature statute. Okay, and there's one other question, um, and I know that Bay Area Legal Aid is LFC funded, which is the Legal Services Corporation, so the question is, do you know if this is something LFC funded organizations can do? And if so, have you had to jump through any particular hoops in order to do it? I can only guess that um, the person's referring to if the client happens to not be a citizen. And I would just say, you know, the LFC um, requirements and criteria would of course apply, but I think the relief 
um, will be available for lots of people who wouldn't otherwise um, be disqualified under LSC. So as long as they meet the LSC, the client meets the LSC standards, um, I, there's nothing otherwise that I think would prevent an LSC organization from pursuing this relief for its clients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Eliza Hirsch talking about the sex offense registry and HIV decriminalization. Take it away, Eliza. Thanks, thanks Eva. Um, and Eva, thank you for putting this together. I know it was a ton of work, but I, I really appreciate it. I'm learning so much listening to my wonderful co-panelists. And also thanks to Jasmine at LAC for, for doing this. Um, one other thing is I know I'm submitting questions. I, I would recommend that when you're submitting questions, um, you type in the name of the panelist you're directing them to because you might send them but they're read at one point, but they're read later. So it might be confusing who you actually want to hear from. Um, so thanks so much. Again, I'm here to talk about um, the, something you may or may not have heard of, the sex offense registration reform that happened this past year. And also very quickly about um, SB 239. Okay. Well, I'm having trouble advancing. Okay, there we go. So um, there is a lot to say, or I have a lot to say, <laughs> which I'm sure shocks all of you, about what this bill does and does not fix about California's, um, the way we deal with sex offense law and registration. I believe that this is um, a great incremental step toward fixing that, and we have a lot to do. So I'm going to try to focus in the few minutes I have on the details of what it what it does do, and um, save for another day the discussion of um, what the next steps are in <clears throat> bringing our laws up to the best possible practices to. Um, really, I think, fulfill the goal probably of everyone on this call, which is uh, ending sexual violence in our community. So, but what does it do? So basically, um, I'm, sorry, I'm getting used to the delay. I'm gonna divide it into kind of four categories. One is registration in tiers, um, who has to register and what tiers they fall in, how people terminate their registration, um, how this law changes Megan's law, which is the online sex offense registry, and then one note about certificates of rehabilitation. Uh, so the first thing is registration and tiers. So one, there, uh, it's so hard for me to not tell you all the background and the back and forth about each of these things, but this law did not change who registers for offenses. That's one thing that did not change. What it did do is it replaced California's universal lifetime registration for every sex offense with a tiered system. And that means all the clients before who are registering under 290, um, no matter what offense they had, under this new law, depending on their offense, they will fall into one of three tiers for adult convictions. And I'll talk separately about juvenile adjudications in a second. If you fall into tier one, you have a minimum registration period of 10 years. Tier two is a 20 year minimum registration period. Tier three is lifetime registration. and I wish I had put a big like boo um, meme right there because <clears throat> there is no empirical basis for lifetime registration. So this is one area where we're gonna have to come back and um, continue to work on reform efforts. Another big boo is that this is based on offense, which also there's not a great empirical basis for having a registry based on offense category as opposed to um, and as opposed to someone's risk level. But that's how this got through based on offense category. Um, there are some uh, you can have a look, uh, an offense that would otherwise put you in tier one, but you could end up in tier three for lifetime registration if there's some other things. If you've been adjudicated as an SVP, if you have certain priors, or if you have a high risk score. It's really important. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, which offenses land in which tiers, which is actually quite um, an undertaking. I have that information. I'm happy to share that with folks, but I, I don't think that's a good use of our time other than to say when you're looking at clients' cases to figure out what tier they might fall in, be very careful about the subdivision. So, for example, subdivision, a very popular one is, I hate to say popular, I don't mean that. A very common offense you'll find um, with our client is Penal Code Section 288A. That, with a lot of wrangling, landed in Tier 2. There's a path off the registry now for people with that conviction. Um, but 
Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision B, there is no path off the registry for that. So mine the subdivision. And again, also whether or not a offense is a misdemeanor or um, felony can make a difference about what tier that lands in. Some exceptions are for juvenile adjudications, a great win by um, a lot of in intensive lobbying by folks at Impact Justice and Nicole Pittman um, was to make sure that um, youth, as long as we couldn't abolish it, which is the registry for youth, which is of course the goal eventually because that's what matches the empirical evidence about best practices. Um, for now, it had, there's a two tier system for people who have youth adjudications, five years for tier one and 10 years for tier two, and that's gonna help a lot of people. There's one other carve out for people who have a conviction they're registering for um, under when they're under 21 and if they meet a lot of specific conditions, they may be able to get off the registry early. Other than that, there's no getting off the registry early. How do you calculate um, the registration period? The period runs from release from custody on the registrable offense. It's not termination of parole, probation, or sentence. So if you served one day of credit time served, your, your date for calculating your period of registration runs from that, from that day. Um, there is tolling, which would be basically adding time to your registration period for subsequent convictions. If it's a new registrable sex offense, you basically start over or worse. If it's a technical violation for failing to register on time, so a 290 registration violation, not a new sex offense per se, but a technical offense under 290.5, um, you get an added three years for a misdemeanor and a five years for a felony. And for all of these things, I want to say, if you think this was bad, can you imagine what it looked like before we got this compromise? Um, and for non-sex offenses, you add a day for every day they're in custody. And I can answer questions about why that's um, based on empirical evidence, but yet yeah, tolling for time in custody and not at liberty. The way of terminating registration, there were earlier versions of this bill that contemplated automatic termination for certain people with cases of a certain age. That did not make it into the final bill, so everybody who's eligible is going to have to petition. There's no automatic removal, another boo. This bill goes into effect in 2021, so, um, and so at that date, people registering in Tier 1 and Tier 2 who have completed their minimum terms of registration will file petitions in their counties of residence where they're registering. They serve it on law enforcement. Law enforcement reports to the court if they agree that the petition or has met the minimum requirements of registration and eligibility. And um, if the answer to that is yes, and the DA um, has concerns that, the, that community safety would be significantly enhanced if the person remained a registrant, they have 60 days to request a hearing, um, and a judge can decide uh, whether or not to grant that if, after an adversarial hearing. Um, if the judge I'm sorry, if the DA declines to request a hearing, then um, the, the person, it, they'll be granted and it goes to the DOJ. There's so much more to say about that, but so stay tuned because I think we're going to have to work a lot of it out with your help. Because as you can imagine, I mean, if you think for a second about that, as advocates with clients who have um, trouble knowing what their own record is, plus calculating incarceration periods, it's going to be very difficult to implement. And so we're thinking through how to make that easier. Megan's Law. Um, the changes to Megan's Law go to effect one year later in 2022. And I have an issue with this because generally I'm basically like, um, there's no empirical um, justification for an online publicly searchable uh, sex offense uh, registry. And so I actually... I, I think this is a big challenge for advocates about how we focus our resources in a better way. Um, but anyway, to the extent until that happens, um, tier one registrants will not be posted on Megan's Law, which will be a good change for some people. People registering for juvenile adjudications are not posted on Megan's Law, but that's the same as it is now. People in tier two um, will have their zip code and city posted on Megan's Law for the duration of their registration. So again, that will be for 20, 20 years. People in Tier 3 who are lifetime registrants will have their full address posted on Megan's Law. And I do want to say, um, I have, I've worked out this document where you can see if that's a change. So when you're reviewing a client's, um, how this law impacts them, you're going to see if they're going to have more information now on the website under this law. The incest, incest exclusions that existed before in place, one big change is that felony section 
243 sexual battery is no longer excluded. And I, if you don't know what that means, it, it, um, then don't worry about it now, other than to say, there are some people for whom I'm going to recommend that advocates take um, action before the law goes into effect in 2021. And I'll be detailing that further um, in more detailed training. But basically, you're going to want to really look into getting that felony reduced to a misdemeanor for your clients so they aren't added to the uh, Megan Bob and they've not been there for many, many years. Um, so again, when you're seeing clients about this, please update them about the new law, new law and we're going to be figuring out how to triage. So the ones who should take action before the law goes into effect, um, uh, we're going to do trainings for reentry providers about that in detail. A few things. One is we're going to reduce some felonies to misdemeanors as soon as possible because that might put them on a lower tier. That might keep them off the, off the website. Another thing is there are a few convictions not for any reason other than like crazy lawmaking that are currently eligible for a certificate of rehabilitation. But under the new law, they're going to end up in lifetime registration tier three with no path off the registry. So people really um, need to um, make sure that they are getting a certificate of rehabilitation for those clients. For example, an example of that is Penal Code Section 288.2 ended up in tier three somehow. I also wanted to make sure that I, I am, as all my friends on the phone know, I'm so behind in keeping up with all the inquiries I'm getting about helping individual clients. And my goal is to really do um, a more fulsome training for advocates. So you have experts in your own offices who can do this. Um, but please warn clients about um, replying to troll lawyers who are getting their names off Megan's Law and charging you know, $5,000 for a consultation right now that will yield to no good results for them. There's a lot of that going on and a lot of really bad letters like that from um, lawyers who are up to make a buck. Also, I want to make sure that you and your clients are following developments at AXOL, which is Alliance for Constitutional Sex Offense Laws, which is the kind of California organizing group around that. Um, and I did also want to say there's these great support groups that um, someone has started and is leading. If you have, I, I send um, announcements about that to the listserv. Okay, I hear that I'm over time, so I need to hurry, but keep your eyes out for that. Okay, one last slide I have about, um, sorry. Um, of, and, oh, so I'll go through this quickly. Sorry, this is um, information about if you're going to consider helping them get a certificate of rehabilitation before. I did want to say people should hold off before on getting um, certificates of rehabilitation. I'm sorry, 1203.4 dismissals for 290 clients, because once you get that, if they're incarcerated one day after you get a 1203.4 for them, they're going to be ineligible for the certificate of rehabilitation. So hold off on 1203.4 dismissals for your 290 clients until right before you're going to be filing certificates of rehabilitation for them. Two things about um, SB 239, another great bill by Senator Weiner, who also was the senator who led the tiering bill. I just want to say that two kind of two real um, heavy lifting efforts um, to think about some of these laws as the public health issues they are and not criminalization. So I, I appreciate that from Senator Weiner. Um, the two things I want you to see is if you see on rap sheets that someone has a felony for health and safety code section 120290, that's for intentionally exposing others to HIV, that is now eligible for um, classification into a misdemeanor from a felony that's previously not a wobbler. So that's something you want to look for. And then this bill also decriminalized um, section, penal, penal code section 647F, not sub F, just F. So if you see that on a rap sheet, it's decriminalized by operation of law, but there's no mechanism um, in the statute to for purging or stealing of those records. And there's no provision that creates a petition process for that. So if you ever see on a client's record, 647F, please um, file a non-statutory um, petition for that, and we can talk about it. I'm interested to hear if you're in that situation. Okay, um, and then I think that's it. I Thanks again to everyone. Um, and if you have questions or you're needing to send clients to me for questions, um, there's my email address, although I'd much rather train folks in your office than talking to clients individually. That'll be more effective. Thanks, Eliza. Um, I think there 
for a couple. There's one question, which is what's the impact of vacated or fully dismissed cases? Does that get someone off the registry? It sounds like you covered that maybe after the person asked, but do you want to quickly answer it? Um, I, I, I think, well, the answer is yes, for sure. If, if a conviction is vacated, they shouldn't have to register at all. Um, and I was going to say that comes from a juvenile expert. And one thing I'll, I know I'm over time, but it, to me, this is a real issue. If you, someone walks into your office and they're registering for a juvenile offense, um, stop what you're doing. And if you don't have time, send them to me because there's lots of folks who are being made to register when they shouldn't actually legally be ha legally have to. So for juveniles, do a double, triple check. And then the question is, if a conviction is vacated, you absolutely do not have to register. If it's dismissed under Penal Code Section 1203.4, you still have to register unless you also get that certificate of rehabilitation. But again, when the new law goes into effect, it doesn't matter what remedies you get. The petition process for getting off the registry um, isn't going to pay attention to what court remedies um, have gone before. Thanks. And next up, we have Rose Kahn from the Immigration Legal Resource, Immigrant Legal Resource Center talking about some recent changes in the law. Thanks, Rose. Hi there. This is Rose. Um, I have uh, roughly, what do we have, seven minutes to talk to you about immigrants with criminal convictions. So here we are. Um, here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to have to quickly go through some of this stuff, but if you all don't know, uh, now you know that immigrants with criminal convictions face severe, devastating, lasting consequences long after their criminal sentence has ended. And sometimes those consequences are not triggered until many decades after even probation has ended. So as you may well be aware, this particular presidential administration was launched with the promise of specifically targeting and criminalizing immigrants, and in particular, those quote unquote bad hombres, those immigrants who have had prior contact with the criminal justice system. So if before in your practice, you have thought that someone else will be handling uh, this, that you don't, that immigration, but intersection of criminal and immigration law is just too complex and you won't get into it, I encourage you to get off the sidelines and please come onto the field. Now is the time we must all be exploring what tools we have access to in our tool chest to help protect immigrants from being targeted in this truly unprecedented way. Uh, and what I will talk about is exactly what those tools are. Luckily, in California, we have a handful of post-conviction remedies that will help mitigate or eliminate the immigration consequences of convictions. I list some of those here, and you'll note that some of these provisions of the Penal Code are not specifically about immigrants, but they, we can derive some immigration benefits from them. Uh, there are laws that I am not talking about. Uh, there are, these have been in headlines recently, in particular because of the Sessions lawsuit challenging them. So you may have heard about California's quote unquote sanctuary state law or uh, its employer regulations, all of that. Those are not impacted. Um, what we're talking about is technical fixes that exist in the California Penal Code that help, again, reduce or eliminate the immigration consequences of convictions. These are not impacted by the current federal attack. Um, the general rule for effective post-conviction relief is that convictions must be vacated based on a ground of legal invalidity. That is laid out in the Board of Immigration Appeals case, Matter of Pickering. I'm pleased to hear someone uh, reference that earlier in the question to Meredith. Yes, in order for, for a conviction to no longer exist on someone's criminal record for immigration purposes, it must be vacated on a ground of legal invalidity. Now that can be any ground of legal invalidity. It need not be uh, constitutional, it need not be 
immigration related. It need not be an effective assistance of counsel, but you must specify that it's been vacated based on the ground of legal invalidity. Um, that said, uh, there are some ways that changing, reclassifying an offense, uh, modifying the federal, the, the designation of the offense can still reap some immigration rewards. So in what context does that come up? Again, general rule, federal law doesn't care whether about a state law classification. So for federal immigration purposes, it doesn't matter whether uh, the state punished the offense as a felony, a misdemeanor, or an infraction. This can create some bizarre through the looking glass results where, for example, a state infraction like uh, the new marijuana sale infraction that was created under Prop 64 could still be considered a ground for mandatory deportation and mandatory imprisonment, which now could be indefinite in an immigration prison. So even a state infraction could lead to these mandatory consequences. However, there are some contexts by where, when if the immigration consequences turn on what the actual sentence imposed was, or what even the maximum potential sentence imposed could have been, uh, reducing that felony to a misdemeanor and specifying that that misdemeanor now carries a maximum of 364 days can actually eliminate the ground of removability and can open up new pathways for immigration relief or new pathways for people to get the green card. So what does that mean? That means if you're doing a Prop 47 or 17B petition, you want to make sure that you specify that that newly reduced felony now carries a maximum potential sentence of 364 days. That is under Penal Code 18.5. Um, it's now written into the CR 181. It's also important to point out that uh, we we have a new mechanism for folks who were received an actual sentence of 365 days. Under Penal Code 18.5, we can petition the court to reduce that sentence by one day. And what a difference a day makes. Again, it will evaporate as a grounds of uh, removability for some immigrants. Uh, I've got one more minute left, um, and it's important if you're not yet aware that 1203.43 is available as uh, essentially a vacator dressed in expungement clothing. It is available for anyone who received a DJ sentence and then a subsequent dismissal or was eligible for dismissal under Penal Code Section 1000.3. So typically we're talking about uh, first time drug possession convictions. Again, important to note as of January 1st of 20. 18, we now have a pre-plea diversion program that's available, uh, which uh, means that there is no conviction for immigration purposes, but for people with pre-2018 convictions, you should look at whether they, and who got these, they should look at whether 1203.43 petition uh, could meet could vacate the conviction. Again, if it's granted, it vacates the conviction and it is not a discretionary expungement. It's mandatory if the person complied with the terms of DJ. Um, whether Prop 64, the Prop 64 vacators work is an open question. Again, we have written into Prop 64 that the conviction is been deemed legally invalid. So we hope that we can argue before immigration judges that that vacator works for immigration purposes. However, if you're going to be safe, you would go about in your Prop 64 order specifying uh, additional grounds of legal invalidity. For example, uh, that the conviction has now been decriminalized or the person was not, or the person was promised that after, that, that they would be eligible for dismissal uh, something like that, uh, so they were formatively misadvised. You can squeeze the Prop 64 vacator also within the 1473.7 motion, which as of January 1st of 2017 is available for people who are no longer in criminal custody to raise claims that they were not meaningfully aware of the immigration consequences of a conviction 
or for citizens and non-citizens that they have newly discovered evidence of actual innocence. The, there's a, we have a sample motion available on our website. Uh, there's also the CR 187 and CR 188 pro se motions that Judicial Council created, which should also meet the Pickering standards for vacator. If you're engaging in this work, please reach out to me at the ILRC as a technical assistance provider. We will be able to support you. Uh, I will answer the one question that's pending. Can you file an 18.5 petition for misdemeanor that had a sentence of 365 days? Absolutely. It, um, the old maximum for misdemeanors was 365 days and under penal code 18.5, you can now petition to have that sentence reduced by one day. We have a model petition available on our website for that purpose. All right, uh, I will pass the mic now to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, that was incredibly informative. Next, we have Kate. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, so, um, I'm very happy to be here today and very grateful for um, for this conference. I think it's so important. And for the next little bit, I will be talking about updates on juvenile fees and records. Um, so here goes. Um, there have been some big updates, big wins. Unfortunately, the wins didn't go as far as we might have liked, but they're definitely a step in the right direction. Let me just click forward. Okay, so I'll start with fees. There's really good news on juvenile court fees. Starting in January of this year under SB 190, California counties can no longer charge administrative fees to families with youth in the delinquency system. And this is a really big win. Um, and what this means is that fees can no longer be charged for things such as detention fees. So um, it used to be that families were billed, you know, up to 25 or $30 a night for every night that their child was in custody in a juvenile hall. Those fees can no longer be charged. Lawyer fees can no longer be charged. So public defender fees or court appointed fees can no longer be, uh, or fees for court appointed lawyers can no longer be imposed. Um, some Similarly, there cannot be fees for electronic monitoring or GPS, and same too with probation or home supervision and drug testing. So counties can no longer charge those fees. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news, of course, is that this didn't go quite as far as um, we had hoped. Um, so young people and families are still on the hook for a few other fees. And I will say that one of the interesting issues when we're talking about juvenile court debt is um, just some of the terminology I think is really confusing and is often used interchangeably. And these concepts aren't interchangeable. So SB 190 was a big win, but it only affected administrative fees. It did not affect two other large sources of criminal justice debt, which is um, restitution. So families are still restitution and restitution fines. So with respect to restitution, um, families are still on the hook for payments to crime victims if that was imposed by a court order by a juvenile court judge, and also restitution fines, which is a fixed amount um, that goes to the state restitution fund, and that's also imposed pursuant to court order. Um, so the new law didn't affect those two types of juvenile court debt. And I will say that, um, you know, I think that for many of the families that we work with, debt is debt, and there's, it's not that obvious that there's a difference between sort of the administrative debt and restitution and restitution fines. So I think it's incumbent upon advocates to make sure that families are informed of the difference between these debts and that we can you know, we know which ones we can challenge and, and how. Um, the other bad news on the juvenile court fees uh, win is that it didn't quite go as far as we would have liked in that families are still um, unfortunately um, legally on the hook for debt that's previously been imposed. So administrative court fees that were imposed prior to January, that, pri that previously imposed debt was, wasn't excused under this new law, which is too bad. But there are, um, I think, real opportunities for advocacy around juvenile court fees. So let me just quickly go through those. So one is um, monitoring com county compliance with SB 190. Um, the muscle behind SB 190 was a policy advocacy clinic at Berkeley Law School that EBCLC worked with very closely on this bill. And um, they've submitted public record act requests to counties 
throughout the state to sort of see compliance. But if you are seeing issues with counties still billing families and imposing these fees, we want to know. So my contact information was at the beginning of this slide presentation. And um, please let me know if you're seeing issues with this. Um, Similarly, I think another area for advocacy is challenging previously imposed debt. So even though the law, the new law didn't necessarily excuse previously imposed debt, that doesn't mean that um, there's no hope. So um, families can petition juvenile courts to modify or eliminate the previously imposed debt. And I've cited to the law that allows for that. Um, and alternatively, if the previously imposed debt was imposed illegally, in other words, if it was imposed without an assessment about the family's ability to pay, that could be a grounds to vacate the debt. And in some counties, um, families, um, mostly through fee organizing, have been asking for refunds of, Ill of illegally imposed debt, which is super exciting and I think very promising, though I can imagine also very hard to get. Um, but there's been some success with that in Contra Costa County, um, and I'm happy to chat with people more about that and connect you with organizations that are doing pretty incredible work on that. Um, the two other grounds I think for advocacy around juvenile court debt is challenging restitution fines. So courts can consider a child's inability to pay when imposing this fine. Um, and this isn't always something that's um, challenged in court, but I think it could be. And similarly around restitution, again, even though SB 190 didn't change anything with respect to restitution, there's still grounds for advocacy in this area too. Um, young people have the right to challenge the restitution amount, which can only cover economic loss. Um, and although courts aren't allowed to consider a child's inability to pay, there are some small loopholes that I think um, if you're working with young people in the juvenile court system, it's worth exploring those. And those are on the I, I cited to the um, code that allows for that. So that's the news on um, court juvenile court debt and, and updates there. So now let's talk about juvenile records. Um, there's some really great news with respect to new laws regarding juvenile court records. So there's now automatic sealing for many young people. So for young people who got off probation from 2014 onwards, the court must seal their records upon, quote, satisfactory completion of probation. Um, and that's in non-707B cases. So many of you know what 707B means, but for those of you that don't, that is a reference to the Welfare Institutions Code provision that sort of lists out the sort of most serious cases in juvenile court. Um, so, so this is good news for those young people who you know, aren't on probation for one of those serious cases. Um, of course, automatic doesn't really mean automatic. Um, there is discretion about what constitutes satisfactory completion, um, and it means no felony or misdemeanor involving moral turpitude during the period of supervision, and that the child has complied with what is in their control to comply with. Um, new law also says that unpaid restitution can't be a bar to sealing, um, and that for sure is a victory. Um, and the good news on on juvenile records, sealing continues. Um, there now is a path for sealing serious cases. So um, it used to be uh, very depressing to talk to young people about record sealing because so many young people were on probation for sub these 707B offenses, these super serious cases. And it used to be that it was sort of hopeless, that there was nothing we could do. But now there is. So um, under the new law, um, if a young person or their lawyer successfully petitions to have their welfare and their 707B offense either reduced under um, Penal Code 17B or dismissed under the Welfare and Institutions Code 782, um, if that happens first, then a juvenile court can, in fact, seal a 707B offense, which is super uh, promising, I think, because it has been so depressing uh, to not have the option, but we do now. Um, and there's also another uh, good case on this, Henry David T., um, and I've included the site for that as well. And then the other good news um, on the juvenile record sealing front is there, and this has been true for a few years now, is that there's no fee for applying to seal your record if you're under 26. And in many counties, they don't charge a fee anyway. And what that really means is that there's no downside in applying to seal your records. So really, we should be encouraging everyone to seal their records. And if for some reason there's an issue, we can deal with it. But there's really no cost in, in applying to have a record sealed. Um, okay, so the bad news on juvenile record sealing. So um, unfortunately, and this is true, I know my record sealing friends are much more expert on this than I am, um, but there are 
mistakes and misinformation abound. So employers don't necessarily know the new law, don't necessarily, or if they do know the new law, they intentionally disregard it. Um, and we see this all the time. We see not necessarily um, employers you know, intentionally disregarding it, but we also see discrimination, both explicit and, and implicit. Um, so every now and then, you know, we do see cases where um, a juvenile record shouldn't be being considered and it is being considered. Of course, the federal government can still see everything no matter what happens. Um, we also um, struggle with um, young people who we've worked with who sort of uh, inadvertently self-disclose that they have a juvenile record even though they don't need to, um, even if a young person doesn't seal their juvenile record, a juvenile record is um, on its own already confidential and it's not considered a conviction. Um, so young people shouldn't be reporting it. But you know, again, because of misinformation um, and because uh, of a lack of sort of public education around these issues, um, young people do self do self report when they don't need to. Um, and the law, you know, there's still gaps in the law. There's a lack of clarity around which records can be sealed. So if a young person has multiple petitions, all of them have to be applied to, you know, you have to apply oftentimes for each individual petition to be sealed. Um, and similarly, young people who just have an arrest that then didn't lead to a petition or formal court involvement, um, they unfortunately are not well situated under the new law. They have to wait until they're 18 to get their records sealed. So there really are some gaps in the law that I hope in fix-it legislation coming up will address. And then, of course, you know, there's the rhetoric of this all being automatic um, for so many young people, but of course, it's not automatic. And so there... Um, there are oftentimes when I'm in court, I see judges not necessarily, you know, um, sealing records because they find that there was unsuccessful completion of probation. Um, so that's the bad news on juvenile record sealing. So room for advocacy in the juvenile record sealing world is there's a lot we can do. So um, definitely because it's not really automatic, um, advocating that our uh, that the young people that we're working with um, have successfully completed um, probation is going to be really important. Um, I also do think that getting a case fully dismissed, whether it's a 707 B offense, you know, one of the serious offenses or not, the power of a dismissed case is pretty great. And in juvenile court. Um, the, dis the language around dismissal is actually broader than in the adult system. So um, getting a case dismissed in juvenile court is actually quite significant and um, can have pretty significant ramifications for whether it can be counted as a strike in the future. Um, so, you know, one thing I think to consider is not just asking for records to be sealed, but also asking for cases to be fully dismissed, because that goes even further. Um, if automatic sealing didn't happen, um, I think that a lot of times there's a mis misperception that, that if the record wasn't sealed initially, then there's sort of no hope, and that's not actually true. There's still room for advocacy. So if a young person is denied automatic sealing or, you know, you're working with an adult who has a juvenile record um, and they got off juvenile probation before 2014, there's still a path to sealing which is under Welfare and Institutions Code 781. Um, it requires filing a petition, often with the probation department in the county. But again, filing this is free. Um, there's a court form that, that is, I, I have a link to on the next page. Um, and so I really think the, the party line you know, to, to people who want to seal juvenile records is apply, apply, apply. It's free. And if there's an issue to um, talk to the, either the public defender in that county or we're also always happy to um, troubleshoot as well here at EBCLC. Um, and then finally, there's also room for advocacy around sealing dismissed cases that um, didn't result in a conviction or, you know, in a finding or also in arrest. If there was only an arrest, there's also paths for sealing there too. So those are the advocacy opportunities. Um, with respect to Finally, with respect to additional information, um, I've included, these are, these are hyperlinks here, to the Berkeley Law Report on Juvenile Fees, as well as the Implementation Guide. Um, and then for court, for sealing juvenile records, I've included a link to um, the application. And um, I definitely encourage, you know, if there are questions, each county sort of has its own idiosyncratic way of processing juvenile applications to seal juvenile records. Um, I wish that weren't the case, but it is. Um, and so 
calling the probation department in the county where the young person was or the adult was last on juvenile probation is probably the most efficient way to figure out um, where that petition to seal a juvenile record should be filed. And again, if there's any bumps in the road, we and of course there inevitably will be, we're more than happy to troubleshoot here at EBCLC. So I'll stop there and if folks have questions, I'm happy to field them. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, we have about one minute for questions and I see that uh, there was a question slash maybe interconnection with the 290 registry to clarify that a dismissal of a juvenile case can end 290 registration. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's from Eliza. Um, right. So, um, so yes. Um, and she's educating me through this webinar, which I am so grateful for. Um, so, um, yes, a dismissed juvenile case will could end um, a registry requirement, which is why the, the getting a case dismissed is so important. It's not. It sounds like, and Eliza can correct me if I'm wrong that a dismissal under 782, these like this sort of really broad dismissal, um, not only sets aside the juvenile finding for purposes of whether it counts as a strike, but it also has the effect of um, having a pretty significant impact on uh, the registry requirement. Thanks. Do we have any other questions before we go to the next one? Oh, and there are two more questions above, whoops. I think those um, are for Rose. Those weren't re juvenile record sealing. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to hold those off to the end just because we are at, we're a little over time. And so hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the very end to answer any uh, questions that are still out there. So next we have Brittany Stonecipher from Legal Services for Prisoners with Children talking about fines and fees in the traffic court context. Take it away, Brittany. Thanks, Eva. Um, so yeah, I'm Brittany Stonecipher. I work with uh, Eva at LSPC. So thank you, Eva, for putting this together. And thank you, Jasmine and Lack, for hosting the webinar and to all the other panelists for all the amazing things that I've been learning while watching this. Um, so LSPC, um, as Eva already mentioned, does policy and organizing and impact litigation work. We're also a support center, so we can provide technical assistance. And my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. If you have any questions um, or would like help on a local level in particular, please let me know. Let me go to the first slide. Um, how do I progress? Okay. So in about 10 minutes, I'm going to cover new rules um, that have mostly um, been implemented over the last year in traffic court. New rules that just uh, became effective in January for parking tickets, some pending legislation, and some opportunities for local advocacy so we can expand these reforms, and then a couple of minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, and as Kate mentioned in her presentation, sometimes fines, fees are used interchangeably. Um, some, I wanna try, sometimes I use them interchangeably. I will definitely try to be specific here um, where that matters. So just to kind of give some context for traffic court, um, traffic tickets don't just apply to driving related infractions. Um, you could have a number of other kinds of infractions usually, but sometimes misdemeanors that are handled in traffic court. A majority of them do have to do with vehicles, but it could be anything from speeding to um, having expired registration or no um, valid license. And sometimes it could be things like jaywalking. So it just depends. Um, and even when your base fine here, as signified by that sort of mint colored square, is something like $100 as an example, you're actually paying a lot more than that because there are all these little individual um, assessments and fees that are added on to the base fine. So that something with a $100 base fine actually ends up being about $490 once all of those are added on. And this is assuming that you pay on time. Um, and also assuming that you didn't get a fee reduction, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you do not pay on time um, or you fail to appear, you can get an additional $300 civil assessment on top of this. 
The law says up to, but pretty much every county um, does automatically $300. So your $100 base fine can very quickly become about $800 um, if you don't pay on time. So there is a whole lot of need for reform in this area because actually 60% of all cases filed statewide, civil or criminal, happen in traffic court. So this is by far the most common experience that Californians have with the court process. Um, so these are the new rules in traffic court that really help low-income people. And of course, we're trying to go further. Um, but first of all, several of the rules of court promulgated by the Judicial Council have changed. And uh, I'm going to stay on this slide for a while and go through each of these. So most of these new rules took effect in May of last year, with one exception that I'll mention when I get there. Um, and these have to do primarily with the right to an ability to pay evaluation, but they also created new notice requirements and expanded good cause. So first of all, um, Rule 4.335 is where the right to an ability to pay was um, was codified, I guess, for lack of a better description. Um, and so what that says is that once a person requests a ability to pay evaluation, they have the right to that in traffic court, um, and you have the right to that at any point that the balance remains unpaid. So it doesn't matter if you've missed your, your deadline to pay. Um, it doesn't matter if you got on a payment plan and then stopped being able to pay, or if you've had notice sent to the DMV. Wherever you are in the case, if you have unpaid some unpaid balance related to that case, you have a right to an ability to pay evaluation. In an adv advisory comment to that rule, it says that the amount and manner of paying must be reasonable and compatible with the defendant's financial ability. So that's not very specific, but it does signify that when someone asks for, for instance, a fee reduction or for an alternative to payment like community service, the court should be taking into consideration um, that person's actual financial ability. So a lot of the time courts are kind of doing a, a blanket, anybody gets this amount of a reduction, but really it should be tailored to the individual circumstances. Um, and the court also has to provide notice and instructions um, or access to materials so that people can access that ability to pay evaluation. Um, and this is a point where you can this is a practice point here. So you can help people with their ability to pay evaluations. Each one of each process is kind of different from county to county. Um, I'm going to talk about a statewide form that's going to be implemented soon. Um, but right now, since May of last year, there's basically 58 different ways of doing ability to pay determination. Some are better than others. Um, but you can help people with their requests for fee reductions. Um, and you can also push your counties to go further than these rules. So for instance, to create tangible um, standards for reduction. So if you are X percentage of the federal poverty line, you get X reduction. Um, you can help them create forms. You can really push them to go a lot further than these rules. So the next rule is 4.107, which requires courts to send out a reminder notice containing information about how to ask for an ability to pay hearing. That reminder notice has to go out before the due date on the ticket. And it has to tell people um, about several pieces of information, including appearance date and location, whether the appearance is mandatory, the total bail amount and payment options, consequences of failing to pay or appear, the right to request an ability to pay evaluation, option to pay through community service, and information for contacting the court, including the court website. Rule 4.105 is the one that was actually implemented before all the others. That one took effect in 2015. And basically, it says that a person shouldn't have to pay the entire balance of their fine, also known as bail, um, before being able to challenge the fine. So that was really one of the biggest first changes that we saw in traffic court, um, was this bar to access, this pay-to-play system um, started to get rolled back a little bit. The next rule is 4.106, which expands the categories that someone um, can say that they had good cause for failing to appear. There wasn't, there still isn't a set list. It's an advisory comment says, including but not limited to some of the classic reasons that were given before, hospitalization, incapacitation, or incarceration. But now it also suggests that courts should include death or hospitalization of an immediate family member, um, responsibility to care for a sick or disabled immediate family member, or any other extraordinary reason beyond the defendant's control. So it encourages courts to be flexible and expansive in counting what counts as good cause for failure to appear. And even if someone 
um, doesn't have good cause, they can still include that $300 civil assessment that I mentioned earlier in their request for an ability to pay reduction. So then this last big change, so moving on from the rules of court, last year in June, uh, June 27th, there was, um, through the budget process statewide, an end to license suspensions for failures to pay, which is very exciting. Um, for several months after June, um, they, there was some delay about whether um, the DMV would continue to maintain holds on people's licenses from before June of 2017 that were issued for failures to pay. Um, after several months of advocacy from community groups, the DMV just posted to their website that they have lifted all outstanding failure to pay holds and they are sending notices by spring 2018. Some people may have already received some notices. There's a little bit of confusion about how to lift this, but if you're confused, um, you can get a copy of the driver's, the person's driver's license on the DMV website for a couple of dollars. You can contact the mandatory actions unit at the DMV, and the DMV, it, it kind of as a last resort, uh, they have a form called the DL-513 for individual requests to list suspensions for failures to pay. Okay, I know that was a lot. <laughs> but this will be um, in the materials that get sent out. Okay, so I mentioned before that each county has its own process for ability to pay evaluations. The Judicial Council just put out a new form that's gonna take effect in, on April 1st of this year um, called the TR320, um, and there's an order that goes with it that is a, I think it's a three page long form. It's optional, which means that the court has to accept some form of this. Court users can decide whether they want to use it for their request and local courts can modify the form a little bit to suit their needs. But basically this will help create a more standardized and accessible statewide, at least form, if not um, evaluation process for ability to pay in traffic court. And to help you kind of understand these rules and how to advocate for further change, specifically on a county level, um, a group that LSPC is part of called the Back on the Road Coalition um, put together an implementation toolkit and it's hosted on the EBCLC website at this link here. Um, and there's also a 58 court breakdown on the EBCLC website of processes that each county is using for ability to pay. So you can, um, and the, the toolkit has all kinds of amazing things in it, including an issue primer, um, some sample motions, know your rights material, um, court watching guide. So it's, it's got a huge appendix of resources. Okay, so just I'm gonna run through this super quickly because I'm sure I'm already running out of time. Um, so there are several other holistic strategies beyond ability to pay um, to combat um, traffic court infractions. Um, so there's vehicle code 41500, which I'll mention again in a minute. That allows someone, currently state law says that if someone was in state prison or county jail for a felony sentence and they had an outstanding traffic ticket, they can petition to get that traffic ticket dis dismissed and they can avoid license suspension related to that, um, that ticket. Um, if your county has homeless court, that can be an option too. You can petition to dismiss in the interest of justice. If the ticket deadline hasn't passed yet, um, you can file a demur saying that there's insufficient evidence. Um, and lastly, you can plead, of course, not guilty and go to trial or no, um, and challenge the ticket there. And if the officer doesn't show up, then often it will be dismissed. Okay, so switching from traffic court to um, parking tickets. So parking tickets are municipal. Um, they are not a matter of state law, um, like the vehicle code. So those are generally dealt with like through a local MTA, Municipal Transit Authority. Um, but passed last year, effective January of this year, AB 503 basically creates a process for payment plans um, for low income people who get parking tickets. So in short, it says that um, it eliminates the authority of a municipality to ask the DMV to place a hold on someone's vehicle registration as a result of outstanding parking tickets unless that municipality also offers a payment plan option for low-income car owners. Um, it waives the parking ticket late fees for low-income persons if they agree to make payments, um, to get on a payment plan and to stay current. 
um, but that is only available within 21 days of receiving the violation or 14 days of the mailing of a delinquent violation. So as I'll mention a little bit more in a minute, that it's not really all that retroactive. This is really only helpful from people, basically from the beginning of March, since we're talking today on March 21st. Um, but it is helpful for going forward for people who have parking tickets and can't afford to pay for them. Um, it establishes a maximum of $25 a month for unpaid balances of $300 or less, and it defines low income as someone who's receiving um, government assistance or is 125% or less of the federal, federal poverty line. Some counties are going further. So San Francisco has a payment plan program right now, basically an amnesty program. So if someone has old parking tickets so it basically makes 503 retroactive. If they have old parking tickets that are unpaid, it doesn't matter whether they're more than three weeks old. If you sign up by May 1st, you can get on a payment plan um, and that will be responsive to your ability to pay. Oakland also created an ability to pay form for parking tickets. So you can, again, work with your counties to go further than state law. Okay, so there are more changes coming down the road, so to speak, pun intended. Um, so pending state legislation include SB 185. So I mentioned before that the rules of court um, on ability to pay create the right to an ability to pay evaluation and that advisory comment suggests that the amount and manner should be reasonable according to someone's ability to pay, but it doesn't create reduct standard reductions. That's what SB 185 is trying to do. It's saying that if you're on government benefits or at 125% of the federal poverty line, you get an automatic 80% reduction. Um, so pushing a little bit further. These next two bills, um, AB 2392 and AB 2876, um, address towing reform and basically say that the towing has to be reasonable and reduces costs. I'm not going to go much further than that. SB 1105 would expand the Vehicle Code 41500, which I mentioned earlier, um, to protect more people, so not just people with felonies who are incarcerated. And AB 2544 um, would attempt to make AB 503 retro fully retroactive, so it's not on a county by county basis. Okay, that was a lot. Um, I don't know that I have time for questions. Maybe I, a few seconds. Yeah, will you answer this one question that was sent out, which is Rule 4.335 just applies to infractions. Is there any equivalent right in a misdemeanor or felony case? Yeah, so not in the rules of court, um, but it, it depends on which felony or misdemeanor fee we're talking about. Um, one of the most painful uh, felony fees in particular is probation costs. And technically in the statute for probation fees, there is a, you're not supposed to be charged for anything beyond your ability to pay. Most probation departments, to my knowledge, are not paying any attention to that, but that is an opportunity um, to get in front of a court and to ask that probation fees be reduced according to someone's ability to pay. So it really depends on which kind of fees we're talking about. Thank you. And um, as we transition to Danica from uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in San Francisco, I, I want to answer quickly a question that was asked in that question is whether or not how the materials will be made available and whether a recording of the training is available. So the materials will be emailed to everyone who attended the webinar along with CLE credit if you're requesting that. And then it will also, all the materials and the training will be available on Legal Aid Association of California's website, which is lacconline.org. All right, the last presentation, which I'm really excited about, is about the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Bail Clinic. Hi folks, this is Danica. I am the Equal Justice Works Fellow here at Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, working on many things related to the bail reform effort in the state and nationally, um, and most specifically, working to create uh, the Bail Clinic, which is designed to provide free consumer legal services to people who have signed contracts with bail bonds companies. Um, and since I only have a couple of minutes, I'm gonna go really quick, but I am super happy to talk to anybody at any point, more specifically about 
any of the bail reform stuff that's happening because there's a lot. Um, let me see. There we go. So I was just gonna like highlight some of the issues with the current system. Talk a little bit about, about like the various efforts happening in the state around bail reform, and then say what the goals of the bail clinic are. Um, so you know, I'm sure people have heard a lot about all of the bail reforms efforts happening across the country. Um, based on the fact that there are just so many issues it causes in people's lives. Um, for example, lots of people are held, oh, I'm going forward instead of back, um, in jail because they just can't afford to pay out. Of course, like every other part of the criminal legal system, there's huge racial and economic inequities. Um, the commercial bail industry ends up transferring a lot of wealth out of poor communities. Um, and it has a disproportionate impact on women of color who are often the co-signers on these contracts. Um, so there are a lot of things happening in the state right now, uh, trying to address some of these problems. The, there is a bill working its way through the legislature right now, that's SB 10, Senator Her Hertzberg's bill. Um, there have been various litigation efforts, some challenging the constitutionality of California's money bail system. Um, also some habeas petitions being filed, which recently um, resulted in the Humphrey decision you might have heard about, which is basically says that judges have to take people's ability to pay into consideration when they're setting money bail. Um, there's been a lot of community organizing happening around the bail reform efforts and then the direct services piece brings us to the bail clinic goals and effort, which is um, I designed this clinic essentially out of seeing that this was the one piece I, that I felt like wasn't really happening in all of these efforts, which was really trying to provide free legal services to people who are suffering right now from these contracts that they've signed with bail bonds companies. Um, so most people who bail out of jail in California have to use a bail bonds company to do so um, because they can't afford to put up the full amount directly with the court because it's on average $50,000. So then they're getting charged these 10% non-refundable premiums by the bail bonds companies um, and the bail bonds industry uh, aggressively pursues these debts um, sometimes for years after the case has been uh, completed in criminal court, oftentimes when file charges haven't even been filed by the prosecutor ultimately because people bailed out in jail before seeing a judge. Um, so people end up like really often not understanding their contract at all, having more unmanageable debt and payment plans that they can't afford. Um, some people are at risk of losing personal property like cars and homes. So essentially, um, in the bail clinic, we are happy to talk to anybody who has signed a bail bonds contract in California um, or people who are thinking about using the service um, and just trying to develop the application of consumer protection law in the state to these contracts. Um, I do have a two page document that I'm happy to send to anybody that talks a little bit more about the goals of the clinic and ways to like screen for these issues and refer people. Um, because I think it's one of the things that people don't self report, but if we start screening for them, um, we might be able to reach a lot of people. And finally, this last slide just has a, a good report that was put out by Human Rights Watch about how money bail in California works. And then uh, I wanted to also say that Silicon Valley debug an amazing uh, base building organization in San Jose is doing a lot of great work around bail reform and has a whole web page that's really useful about the Humphrey decision with a sample motion for people to use to um, petition the court to take ability to pay into consideration when they've set bail. Um, that was very fast and a lot, uh, but again, just wanting to make sure that people know that this is something that we're trying to address and I'm happy to talk to anybody at any time. Thank you so much, Danica. This is um, really exciting, and I'm excited to see this model kind of continue to grow throughout the state. Uh, does anybody have any questions for about the bail clinic? All right. 
Um, that's time. And so, um, as I said, all the materials, including the PowerPoints, will be emailed to everyone who attended uh, this webinar, and also they'll be available on LACONline.org. That's L-A-A-C online.org. Um, and we're at time. Thank you to all the presenters for uh, taking the time to give us this quick recap and summary. And if people have additional questions, please reach out uh, directly to those presenters. I believe we pretty much all had our email addresses available on our slides. Thanks. Thank you. This is Jasmine from the Legal Aid Association of California. Um, for those who wanted to know about MCLE um, certificates, you will be receiving those after I review today's in-session times. So that will likely be um, by the end of the week. Uh, with that, I will also be sending all of the PowerPoints and any other materials that um, the presenters referenced, if there were any. Um, we hope that you can check out some of our next webinars. We're going to be having a consumer series coming up uh, later in the spring. Um, so yeah, and if you have any questions and you um, missed one of the presenters' emails, you can also send them to me at trainings with an S at lackonline.org, and I will forward that to the necessary person. So thank you again to all of our presenters for this really great presentation, and thank you to everyone who stayed with us this whole time. Um, have a great afternoon. Bye.